last week, <clears throat> we looked at um, when God had called Gideon to be obedient to him, to be the deliverer, that the first thing he had to do is he go, had to go to his father's household and cut down the idols, which is a very big deal, you know, because oftentimes when God's calling us to do something obedient to him, wherever, outside of our comfort zone, the first place of outside of our comfort zone is home. Okay, so if there's stuff going on at home, stuff going on in your personal life, God's going to say, you have to take care of that first. And so he does it at night. He doesn't do it during the day. And there are those who want to kill him for cutting down the altar to Baal in his father's house. But the Lord stands up for him, works through his dad. And there seems to be um, a level of repentance that goes on in his family. And we'll kind of see that as we go along here with what takes place. But in verse 32 of chapter 6, it says, Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbabel, that means disconfitter of Baal, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. So in other words, everybody's like, we need to kill your son for what he did. He's saying, well, Baal's a god. Let him deal with him himself. Apparently he can't stand up for himself. So dad calls his son Jerubbabel. His name is Gideon, which means a cutting. So it's interesting that this guy's name has to do with what he's going to do in life with idolatry first. So remember, the reason why the Midianites and the Amalekites are wreaking havoc on the Israelites is because of idolatry. So the first thing he does is knock out the idolatry at home. And that was a big victory. And you think you have a moment to cheer yourself on, but immediately the enemy responds. And this is all in God's plan but there's a major mobilization of Midianite and Amalekite troops. Verse 33, it says, Then all the Midianites and Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the Valley of Jezreel. Now, the Valley of Jezreel is what we know to be as Armageddon. That's the place where God will ultimately gather all the nations of the world together under Antichrist to try to make war against God. And you read the book of Revelation, you find out what happens. So it's not a good idea for all the armies of the world to take on Christ. But that's the place right there. That's where these Midianites and these Amalekites are gathered together. And so you go from one victory, but it's not a final victory. It's a victory that's going to lead into another battle with the enemy. And this is no doubt an intimidating sight. Remember, um, they were in bondage to these people for years. They're living in fear. He's, the deliverer is threshing wheat in a wine press. That's not a place of boldness. That's a place of hiding. They're in caves. They're in dens. They're, they're scared. And then over 100,000 troops, people, warriors, show up to make war against Israel. Verse 33, or verse 34 says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And that's the key right here. Not Gideon mustered himself. Gideon came up with a plan. Gideon was bold. Gideon went out and fought him. It's But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. This is always the secret of strength for the man of God. It's the power of the Spirit of God. And literally, it's clothed him. It, it robed him. It, the Holy Spirit himself came to this man, and he's going to empower him. He's going to energize him to, to rally the troops the right way. He's going to be the one at the end of this chapter who gets all the glory. Excuse me, at the end of chapter 7, who gets all the glory for the victory of this battle. As we know, that's what's going to happen. But the first thing to note is the Spirit of God. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. That is always God's will. Not by your own ingenuity, by your own coolness, by your own charisma, by your own ingenuity. It doesn't work in a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual problem. That's why the Midianites and the Amalekites are there. Idolatry. They need more than just a battle that could be won against the Midianites. God can do that by himself. He doesn't need one Israelite. The greater battle is the one of sin and repentance over the work of the devil. That God so desires 
to give them. He's going to use this battle to teach them something. He will deliver them, but the Spirit of God is on this man, not only to be a great military leader, but to bring judgment to the nation of Israel. Truth, righteousness. He will empower him now, clothe him. And for the Christian, our strength is in being filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled, Paul says. Be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he went into his earthly ministry, was filled, baptized physically, yes, but the Spirit of God came upon him and even, and even um, empowered him for the ministry in a, in a mysterious way. And so that's our strength there. It's the Spirit of God. It's the same Spirit that comes upon Gideon throughout the Judges. The New Testament is ours. And so the Spirit of God comes upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet and the Abuserites gathered behind him. Now, who were these people? Well, if you were to go back to verse 24, to this day, it is still in Oprah of the Abuserites. So some of these people were those who wanted him dead when he cut down the idol to Baal in his father's house. Now some of these people are gathering around him. There's a victory right there. There's some repentance. They know the Midianites and the Amalekites are coming, but he blows the trumpet and the people that were against him are now following him. And so they gather behind him. And then in verse 35, he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Now, we're going to see that there's about 32,000 men who come to fight with Gideon. And so Gideon said to God in verse 36, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowlful of water. Now that's interesting, because he knows the Lord spoke to him. What's he saying in his request for a sign. If you're really going to do as you said, I know you said it. You already gave me a sign with the staff and the, and the, and the offering. And, um, but if you're really going to do what you said you're going to do, do one more thing for me. Do you mind? I went to Walmart. I got a, a, a sheepskin car cover. I'm going to put that on the ground. You've seen those, right? I'm going to put that on the ground. And just could you make every, could you just make it wet? and everything else dry. Would you mind doing that? It's just a little favor I need here. And it's interesting because he's asking for what? He's asking for a sign that God's really going to show up. Now, God has already shown up by coming upon him. But it tells us that even a man who's called, a man who has heard God, a man who has been clothed with the Spirit of God may still have questions. And you know in your own life that there's been times where you have just wanted to know what the will of God is for your life, right? Lord, how do I know that this is the right thing to do or not to do, right? You're driving down the road. You're thinking about, maybe this is like 50 years ago for some of us, dating somebody, right? And, okay, Lord, it's a green light right now. If you want me to keep dating her, keep the light green. If the relationship's going too fast, put the yellow light up. If it's a red light, I'll take it as a no. And, you know, that's not a good idea. That's a green light. I'm just going to keep going. Or it's a yellow light, and you just, like a lot of us do, you speed up instead of slowing down. And if it's a red light, you're like, well, I can still go right on red. So I can still be in a relationship as long as I'm going in the right direction. You can make things up as you go along if you're really looking for signs. You know that. It's not really a good idea, but God does still lead us, right? So a couple of things to take note of here, and we're going to look at the second part of this sign that he asked for that God gives him is, number one, God is very patient with him. God doesn't say, I can't believe you're asking me for a sign that I'm going to do this. I showed up. I talked to you. I already 
um, dealt with your offering and showed you that this is real that way, um, how much more do you really need to know? Because sometimes we're, we're just, you know, we're weak and we try to kind of figure things out on our own and we struggle with it. And you really want to know God's will and it's not always like you're going to see a sign in the sky. You have the word of God, right? You have the word of God, but if it's a specific thing that you feel led to do or you want to do, that may not be in the Bible, right? Like marrying somebody or not marrying somebody or taking a job or not taking a job or stepping into ministry or not stepping into ministry or moving or whatever it is. So F.B. Myers was uh, on a ship one night traveling, and it was a really thick fog, and he noticed that he couldn't see anything on the land, but the captain was able to steer the ship into port. And so he talked to the captain afterwards. He said, how'd, how'd you do that? We can see a thing. And he said, well, I know what to look for. He said, there's three lights on shore, and I know that when those three red lights line up exactly, I go straight towards the lights. That's how I know to, to be guided in. Or you could wreck the ship on rocks, on land, on the dock, whatever. And so F.B. Meyer, and I like what he said, he said, there's, there's three things that you can usually go by when you're trying to determine the will of God. And some of it's subjective, but it's also objective as well. And the first thing is there's an inward impulse. An inward impulse. There's a desire to do something, right? And you maybe not be able to get that desire out of there. Secondly, of course, the Word of God. Does it match up with the Word of God? Or is it in disobedience with the Word of God? I don't want to beat on the dating thing, but like oftentimes... A guy or a girl is like, I love her so much, I think I should marry her. Yeah, but the Bible says don't be unequally equal with an unbeliever. So that's disobedience right there. So you may have an inward impulse to be with that person, but if the Scripture says not to do it, you know right there that your inward impulse is wrong. You need to have that corrected by what is written. But if the inward impulse lines up and it's, and it's a biblical desire, right? You can't say that it's wrong. It's a good thing to do, it could be marriage, it could be work, it could be whatever it is, ministry, then there's something else that will usually help, and that's called trending circumstances. What's actually going on in your life, right? You know, I'm going to buy this car. It's got to be the Lord. I've got an inward impulse for that red Ferrari, right? And the scripture doesn't say anything like, like I shouldn't buy a car, right? So I got a green light there, kind of. Well, do you have the money? No, but I believe I'm stepping out in faith. <laughs> that's not faith, that's foolishness, right? So, and that's just an example, and of course, it's a very flawed example because you, you can't just look at purchasing, purchasing a car or always a relationship, but sometimes that's exactly what we're dealing with. Maybe on a, a smaller level, right? There's a purchase, there's a move, there's a job, there's a relationship, there's a ministry. Lord, well, should I be doing these things? And... I think that's a good way to at least line things up, right? The inward impulse, the scripture, and the trending circumstances. You know, we, when we started the church years ago, there was something, I talked these things through with my pastor, and one of the things, it's biblical, the trending circumstances were favorable, and there was an inward impulse. But one of the things I just couldn't get away from was it wouldn't leave me, that I was supposed to leave in a good way the church is at, and then I was to plan another church, you know, but there's there's people who do things and it's just not right because things really aren't lining up, but they're forcing it. I know these are just examples. And it can be different for you as to what you're going through. But at some point in your life, you do want to know the will of God, right? Because you know when God's leading us, there could be changes. There could be maybe not changes in a relationship or a location or, or work or whatever, but just changes. And we want to know, God, am I in the right path here? Because there will always be battles that we have to face against the enemy. And he's always going to call us to follow him and to step by faith. So it's always going to be faith. Am I going to trust you? And we have to trust that the shepherd will lead us. Because he said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And that's the key right there. And if he needs to, he can give us enough evidence that we're on the right path as he did with Gideon. He's going into a major war here. I don't fault him for doing the, uh, the fleece thing. And God answers his prayer. And then that wasn't enough. Look at verse 39. I love this. Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me just speak one more time. 
Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Come on, I got a two for one at Walmart. Let it be, let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground, let there be dew. Right? Because, you know, Lord, maybe at night everything was dry. Maybe somebody spilled some water on the fleece. Let it be wet and everything else be dry. Let it be dry and everything else be wet. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. And so God just faithfully and mercifully ministered this man, ministers to the man as to what he needed before he stepped into a war. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. And so one of the lessons you learn here in this is that God's not going to share his glory with anybody. And he knew that it would be dangerous for the Israelites to win the battle that he's going to give them the victory to win if they had that many people, because they're going to, they would start to think, we must have had something to do with this. I mean, there were 32,000 of us, and we are the children of God, and I'm a pretty good fighter. Once you take credit for what God is doing, it's over. Gail Irwin was, uh, he shared a story about a guy who was just doing very well in ministry, a young guy and very well in ministry, and uh, the Lord is blessing it. And somebody asked him, in the ears of Gail Irwin, <clears throat> so what was the secret? What, you know, what did you do for this to happen? And Gellar just said to himself, if he says anything except for the grace of God, it's over. And his answer wasn't the grace of God. The answer was, well, this is what we did. This is how we got this done. This is what we... And sooner than later, it just, things fell apart in his life. It's not just good enough just to say it, oh, the grace of God. It's really to understand, apart from the grace of God, we can do nothing. He gets all the glory for anything good that happens, all starting at the cross of Christ. That's why we're saved in the first place, is the grace of God. So anything he does through us is because of his grace. And it's so important to just point all the glory back to Jesus. We get in trouble when we start taking credit for things, period, and claiming glory. And that's a problem with mankind. It's pride. And so God is saying, that there's too many people here, Gideon. And Gideon is probably thinking, too many people. We're at a great odds right now. God's saying, there's too many people for me to give them the victory. Because they're going to they're gonna lift themselves up against me. And they're going to take credit for it. And so here's what we need to do, Gideon. Now, this is a tough one. But in verse 3, he says, Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. That is a large chunk of people. You know, you know, if you ask that question in a war, how many people here are afraid? Raise your hand. Okay, you could go home. Not, you might want to try going home or just, you know, work on it. Try to get some courage to stay, please. Just, no, go. And they took off. You're at about 135,000 now to 10,000. It was 135,000 to 32,000. Now it's 135,10. And you would think that God's saying that is enough. That's a perfect amount right there. Good. Okay, really outnumbered, no way they're going to take credit for it. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. They are. <laughs> That's not in the Hebrew, but it's probably in Gideon's mind. Seriously, Lord? The people are too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. This isn't you're testing. This is coming right from me. So now God is going to test them with a water test. Very simple, very normal 
um, area of life for him to bring a test, a spiritual test with water. Uh, somebody once said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. God reserves the right to test us. God tests us. We don't need to test other people. He does, and he tests us so we can see what type of faith we really have or don't have. He already knows. He's not trying to figure it out. And secondly, when he tests us, um, he wants us to grow in our faith. So he wants us to see whether we have real faith or counterfeit faith or weak faith or stronger faith. And then he wants our faith to grow. And so he says, bring them down. Um, and then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. And so God, God's the one who's going to separate those who will fight and those who won't. And so you got 10,000 people. They are going to hear Gideon bring a test before them. Look at verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Now that's an interesting test. First of all, God just took the ratio to, to a, an unheard of low. So if you have 130-some thousand uh, Midianite Amalekites verse 300, that's 450 men to one. God says that's a perfect, that's a perfect fight right there. Got it. No way you're going to take credit for it. And as we go on further to this, the way they do the battle, it's got to be all God. But what he does here is he tests them um, at the basic level of human need, right? What's more normal and what's more common than drinking something? What, what, what when you are, if, if, when you're hot and tired um, and you are just so thirsty, what do you usually go for? You know, a bottle of water or a Gatorade or whatever it is, you know, your drink of choice, but you know what it's like. And when you haven't had something for a while, and you have an opportunity to drink, you might want to guzzle that thing down and not, and not take it carefully. And so you, some people aren't exactly sure as to how the test looked, um, but you can, you, can, you can learn from it that what God was looking for was how they drank that water. And by how they drank the water told you a lot about the man in the middle of a war zone. Did they have enough conviction? Did they have enough consciousness as to be aware that at any time they could be struck by the enemy? Was their desire to drink something so strong that they would give into it over being aware of the enemy's presence? Were they just going to throw their face into the water and not look? Were they going to dive into the water, you know, head first in front of other men? Or were they going to drink it, watching? Were they vigilant? As Peter tells us, to be vigilant, to be watchful, right? To be sober, to be watchful, because we have an enemy who's always uh, roaming about to see who he could be devoured, to who he could devour, knowing that we're in a spiritual battle, a Christian. You have an opportunity to take something that's totally legitimate, something like water. But what you do with that common thing tells God a lot about you. He already knows, but it's more like us figuring out what we're really about. Somebody gave a story about him um, taking a drive in his car with his 2B boss. And the boss, you know, he, he's kind of getting to know the guy. And so he said, why don't, why don't we take a drive in your car? We'll go somewhere. This is a normal conversation, not knowing this guy was looking at his car, looking how he drove his car, looking how he kept his car, because it meant a lot to his future boss. Something very normal, what your car looks like, right? Don't look at my car. I had five kids. There's French fries under the seats, stuff. <laughs> But, but you understand the point here, just those normal things that you might take for granted. God says right there, drink of water. 
separate these 300 men. I'm going to tell you who they are. The other guys is send them right home. God could have used them, but he didn't need any of them. He didn't need the 300. But it's the ones who were vigilant, who had conviction, who were aware, and God says, by them, right there. Who would we be if you got tested with a drink of water or got tested with something else? Do you just cave in to your passions? Do you cave in to, to your desires, even for the legitimate things, over God's will? Does it consume us? Does it take our attention away from the kingdom of God and from what's going on around us? So here, this test of separation. And then in verse 8, the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands. And he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Wow. Can you imagine that? This is it. Don't you think the Lord meant to send us home and keep the 9,700? Is there a mistake here? <laughs> Gideon said, I wish there was. <laughs> no, we, this is God's plan. He doesn't need numbers. He doesn't need the strength of man. What God needs are men and women who want to give him all the glory, who know that it's in weakness that we're strong, not in our own strength. That's what Paul said, right? When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why? Because then God's glory is displayed. God's power, not man's power. Because as somebody once said, if you can explain it, then God didn't do it. It's got to be God doing it, not man. When man gets in the way, God gets robbed of his glory and other people aren't blessed. Look, the reason why we're going to get blessed from this story is because God did this. We'll see what happens when man gets in the way at the end of the chapters tonight. There's 300. I can imagine being there. I can imagine. I, 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 to be honest, I probably would have been shaking in my sandals. All right, what do, what do we have to fight with here? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Because remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, they're not natural as a Christian. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so... God's got their weapons all ready for them. And they're really interesting. Look at verse 9. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, said to Gideon, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant. Now, when God says, if you're afraid, God knows you're afraid. He's saying, if, like, since you are, it's like having a test. Let me tell you what's really in your heart by the test. If you're afraid, and you are, go down, take your servant with you, go down to their camp, sneak down there, okay? Be sneaky, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. You've seen that picture of locusts all over the ground, just spread out. That's what it was like. That was a, an eastern expression. It was like locusts, man. This is, they, were, they were just so many of them. And their camels were, were without number as the sand by the seashore and multitude. This is an intimidating sight. God says, I want you to go down there. Now sneak up, go to the outpost, and I want you to listen to something. So verse 13, it says, when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. So he overhears two men, Amalekite, Midianites, either one, right? And he hears them talking about a dream. And the one said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. That's a dream that God gave this guy, guys. Verse 14, then his companion answered and said, 
This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. What? How'd you get that out of that dream? God said, now go down there. Just go down there. You're afraid. Go. All right. He's down there. I had this dream, man. This loaf of barley bread came storming through, rolling in here, just blew out this tent. The other guy's like, we're dead. We're dead. That's, a, that's God. That's the, that's the Lord. That's the sword of the Lord, Gideon. And Well, the, the, the barley bread was the bread of the poor man. So what's God saying here? That these poor people are going to mow you down. He's already causing fear in the camp of the Midianites and the Amalekites. And he wants Gideon to know, I got this. And Gideon's going to go back, we win. But you know what else he's saying? That loaf of bread, that's you. You're a loaf of bread. <laughs> and not only, you're not even like wonder bread. You're barley bread. You are a poor piece of barley bread, Gideon. But be of good cheer. You're going to mow them down. They know it. What's he doing? He's already discomfiting them with warfare. God has a way of just winning battles without us. Remember those lepers in the book of Kings who go out. They're going to fall to the Syrians. And the Syrians heard horses coming. And they all took off because they thought they were getting invaded and they left all this food and they left all their clothing and all their money there and these lepers found it and then they went back and it was the fulfillment of a prophecy by Elisha. God just said, you know what? I think I'm just going to scare these people. I'll just send some horses in their, in their minds or spiritual ones. Who knows what happened? But he can just do things to people without us. And so Gideon is totally encouraged about this. In your life and in my life, there's spiritual warfare going on all the time, and God is doing battle for us in the invisible realm, and we don't even know it. And he does a very good job without us. The best place for us to be is submitted to him, looking to him, and following his lead, and giving him all the glory. And so in verse 15, it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. I love that. He just worshiped right there. Praise you, God. That's the place God wants us in, that place of worship. Understanding who he is and acknowledging it, Lord, you are doing this. And this is what God brings us to, to, to be for him, worshipers. That's what, that's what he calls us to be, worshipers. You know, And it's in that place of worship that he is his best, just giving God all the glory. He's going to go back and say, guys, God has got this one. Praise the Lord. We, we, we win. Look, he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. And just these 300 men are getting confirmation from Gideon. They see their leader worshiping God. They see him at peace. They heard about the dream. And in case Gideon's losing his mind, they might think he's nuts. His servant Pure is right there. Guys, I was right there with you. You, you know, they can look at him and, and he can say, you think I want to go fight 130 some thousand people with 300? You think I'm nuts? God told me to go down there and I heard the dream. We win. And here's our weapons. Look. First, verse 16, order. Order is so important. Then he divided the, three, the 300 men into three companies. This isn't just going to be a free-for-all like you see in Braveheart, you know, screaming and, no, we're going to, this is going to be ordered. A hundred under a leader, a hundred under a leader, a hundred under a leader. You follow the leader. God is a God of order. Don't break ranks. Same thing with us. Don't break ranks. Second of all, he put a trumpet into every man's hand, Okay. Where's my sword? Here it is. This is a trumpet. This is not a sword. This is all you need. Take this trumpet. And empty pictures. What's this for? Well, you're going to put this torch inside the pitcher. So they have a trumpet, a horn. They have an empty pitcher, and they have a torch, a light. Put the torch in the pitcher, an empty pitcher. 
take your trumpet. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch. In other words, follow my lead. Follow the follow directions, okay? And when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. So God's giving you the, the, the victory. They're already afraid. I don't know how this is going to happen, but do what I tell you to do. God gave me the orders. Take your trumpet, take your torch, put it in your empty pitcher, follow your leader, do as I do. Don't break rank. Same thing for us. You know, we have been given the Holy Spirit. We have the weapons of our warfare. We have Ephesians chapter 6. We have our leader, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives leaders also in our lives. He says, this is what you do. Don't break rank. Give God all the glory and trust him for the victory. Trust him for the victory. Because ultimately, the victory is God's. We just get to be in it. And, and what this is going to do is bring us to that place of worshiping God when we see what he does. When I blow the trumpet... I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So there were two swords, the Lord's and Gideon. Everybody else, as far as we know, didn't have a sword on them, as far as we know. But it's all he needed, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. But it's really the Lord's sword that counts. You're going you're gonna to cry this out. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. That's about 10 p.m. Just as, they had post, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. And then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. Note that. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. What did they do? They, they broke the pitchers. They held out the torches. They blew their horns. And they cried out. And they stood there in their place. And God discomfited them. No doubt they, they were startled by this. It's at night. They're not ready for it. But they've already been prepared by a dream or probably more dreams than that. And God says, I'm going to bring light into the darkness. I'm going to do it. My sword. That's how God defeats the enemy, by bringing light into the darkness, right? Bring his light, the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ through his word. Declare it. Proclaim that. This is a spiritual victory. It's a spiritual battle. You guys don't even have to fight. The fighting you do is being obedient to me. And we see here, Verse 21, every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. How can you explain thousands of men striking each other? It was the Lord. God disconfitted him. And he said that he would do this in the law that he would discomfit the enemy. He'd bring confusion to the people. They, they wiped themselves out. And the army fled to Beth Acacia, those who were left, toward Zerira, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Taba. And so the major part of the war was accomplished by God. Here, it, I, just, I just defeated them for you. Now he's going to give them some mop-up work to do, which is important for them to follow up with. But they just watched God win. How'd it go? It was great. What'd you do? I blew a trumpet. I broke a pitcher. I held out my light. I preached God, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. It's all about God. And we just watched them kill each other. There's no way they could have won that battle. It would have been one on 450 300 times. Not in the flesh, they couldn't have. I can imagine them just sitting there. Yep, yep. 32,000 would have been too many for God. 10,000 would have been too many for God. As a matter of fact, he didn't even need 300. Those 300 were chosen. 
not because of their greatness, but because of their vigilance, because of their conviction. God said them. Because they're the ones who are going to know all glory goes to God. Who would we be out of the 32,000? Fearful? God says, well, if you're fearful, why are you fearful? You know, he doesn't just tell us to go home from church and to don't be engaged in the Christian walk, but he will challenge our, our fear. And God doesn't need us, but he also tells us not to be afraid. Jesus told his disciples, he said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, and after that they have no power over you. None. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And he's not saying he'll throw you in hell as a Christian. He loves you. He's saying God is the judge of all mankind. The one to be feared ultimately is him. He has the power over all. How often in the Bible do we hear God saying, fear not, for I am with you. But would you be of the 22,000 that went home? Would you be of the 9,700 that just put away conscience, put away conviction, put away caution, you know, being watchful and just throw yourself into your food, throw yourself into your comfort, throw yourself, these things could be legitimate, into your sleep, into your, into your, into your work, into whatever it is, more than, more than God's will and what's going on. I pray that we would be aware of what's going on. Watchful, useful, men and women of conviction, And that we learn this lesson here. God doesn't need us, but he uses those who are sober-minded and understand what's going on and are watching, okay? So we, we receive what's legitimate. God didn't want them to not have a drink of water, but he chose the ones who did it the right way. And then those who would give the glory of God, those who wouldn't break rank, those who kept order and did what they were commanded to do. Very simple. God says, do what I tell you to do. It's like I do. And watch me work and watch you be blessed, and watch the enemy get routed, and watch people get saved, watch people get delivered. That's what we see here. Now, it says in verse 22 that they fled to, towards Zerira, as far as the border of abel Mahola by Tabath, and the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. And so they're on the run now, right? These were left over, and then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. And then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. So now the Ephraimites are getting involved. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb. They killed at the winepress of Zeb. You see, We're going to name something after you today. This is going to be the Rock of Oreb. Why? Because we're going to kill you here. And you get to have the wine press of Zeb. No thanks. I already know why. But they get to execute these two evil kings. And they pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Now, chapter 8 is interesting. We're going to try to make a little headway here and see what we can get done tonight. Interesting what happens here. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. Isn't that interesting? You have this giant victory. The enemy's routed. You're you're chasing people down. He just calls you, hey, help us out. You know, guard this place. And they get to kill. They get get to execute two evil kings. That, That was a big deal. That was an honorable thing to be able to do for your people. And then they criticize him. How come he didn't call us to go down, you know, to fight the Midianites? You have to to bring that now? There's some people who are just always going to be critical. And oftentimes it's because, you, you know, you want something more than what you have. I can guarantee you that they probably maybe would have had maybe one guy, maybe 301 people would have stayed for the battle you know, because the majority of them would have gone home too. Well, we would have gone. Yeah, sure he would have, because God separated uh, everybody except for 300. But they, they reprimanded him sharply. Here's the guy who's the judge, and they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're rebuking him. So listen to his answer. Very interesting. He said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? 
Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? And what he's saying here is what you guys got to do was to the grapes that were gleaned, what you got to gather was you actually took these guys out. That was more honorable than if you look back at the 300 who watched people take themselves out. They didn't, they didn't get to kill any of the enemy. You did more than they did. What are you complaining about? Right? And, but a soft answer turns away wrath. Harsh words stir up anger. Here he is. The judge doesn't say, you know what? Execute these guys. He doesn't do that. Not here. But here he, he gently reprimands them back. And, and says, look at what God did through you. God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What was And what was I able to do in comparison with you? And then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. Interesting. So there are times, you know, you might get criticized, challenged by somebody. They could be wrong. And don't let your pride respond. A soft answer turns away wrath. Now, he is going to deal with some people more harshly as we go through here, and there's a slide downward after this, as we'll see. So we'll see what we can get done tonight here. So um, we have the whole truth here. We have the whole story of Gideon. So you have this great victory, and then you have some other stuff that happens afterwards. Verse 4, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over. They're exhausted but still in pursuit. And then he said to the men of Sukkoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Sukkoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? That was a bad answer. In other words, why we give you? What? Well, we don't see them in your hand. I'm not giving you anything. What they're doing is they're not only rebuking him, they're, by not assisting him, they're actually giving aid to the enemy because these guys are going to get away. These guys are starving. They're exhausted. They need food, and they wouldn't give them food. Sad. So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. In other words, I'm going to make a scourge, a whip. I'm going to come and whip you guys. <laughs> So there was the soft answer that turns away wrath. Now there's this, the whip of thorns. Interesting. He's tired. Cut him a break. He's exhausted. I'll tell you, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to clean house. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth answered. And so he also spoke to the men of Penuel saying, when I come back in peace, I'm going to tear down this tower. He's getting tired. He's a little cranky. No, these people aren't helping him, though. So watch what happens. Verse 10. Now, Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east for the 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So that's where you get the number of 135,000 Midianites and Amalekites. There's 15,000 people left. God took out 120,000 people. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of Nobah and Jogbaha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. Right? So they're, of course, he can't get us, so they feel secure. Get them when they're resting. Get them when they feel safe. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. Now, so remember the two Groups of people, they wouldn't help him. He says, when I get them, I'm going to come back and deal with you. So he tracks these guys down. They route the whole army. They take the two kings. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Heres, and he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him. He said, you got you. You guys, from, you're from Sukkoth? Yeah, I am. Okay, come here. He wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and its elders, 77 men. Remember, they were the guys who said, we're not helping you. He said, I'm going to tear your tower down. Guess the young guy. Who are the leaders? I'll tell you. Eventually, it's going to come out. He writes it down. Then he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. The idea there is he, 
He disciplined them in front of everybody. You ridiculed me. You didn't help us. Here they are. Then he tore down the Tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Why? It's really harsh, but it's because they assisted the enemy. Now, is he getting too heavy-handed with, with people here? Perhaps. Because we see, though he had been given this great victory, and he was right in, in being angry at them for not helping, watch what happens as we trend towards the end of the chapter here with Gideon. He said to Ziba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And so they answered, as you. So they were. Each one resembled the son of a king. Now that's an interesting statement. He talks to these kings. He killed a lot of people. What were they like? They were like you. They were sons of kings. That's flattery. They're trying to flatter him. Now somebody once said, flattery is a good thing to taste, but a bad thing to swallow. Somebody flatters you, they're lying to you. They want something. Don't swallow it. Then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise, kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. He wants his son to do it. He's trying to give his son an opportunity to, 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 to do the work of God. Because he did, men didn't need to be put to death. But you learn something here that sometimes somebody's just too young to fulfill a difficult task. Couldn't do it yet. So Ziba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. And so Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Interesting. What they're saying is, you do it. And it's not like they're, they're challenging him. They don't want the youth to rise and kill him because he's scared, he's young, he's not as strong, he's not as accomplished. And if they botch the execution, they're going to suffer more. That's why they said that. <laughs> you do it. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, now there's some time passing here, but watch what happens. Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Be our king. That's what he's saying. Rule over us, not judge us, rule. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now that's the right answer. The temptation is, hey, what a job. You're a godly man. Be a king. Well, they had one king. That was God. So his answer is right. But notice verse 24. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had gold ear, golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And so they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment and each man threw into the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian and besides the chains that were around their camels' necks. Now <clears throat> I read that that's about 40 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold. That would make him a very, very wealthy man. Plus the other stuff. I will not be your king. I will not rule over you. Near the room, my sons or my grandsons. But would you mind <laughs> giving me some of the earrings he got there? Right? And you know, you can justify it. Well, I led you there, and this is the plunder. But that's what was what God wanted him to do. He basically said, I won't be your king, but I want to be the richest guy in Israel. Hand it over. And they did. And so he's not going to be a king, but he's going to live like a king. And then here's what happens, guys. He's sliding here because the, the danger that we're in, even after a victory, sometimes is greater than being in the battle itself. Because the enemy's dead. You dealt with things. You dealt with people, some people the right way. Some people, it could have been too hard. 
but he has an opportunity. He does what's right. I will not be your king. I will not rule over you, but I will be the richest guy in Israel. And then you can see the slide into a different type of coveting. He's coveting something that he wasn't called to do, which is into like a priesthood. It's, it's strange. But look at, what he, look at what he does in verse 27. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city. The ephod was something in the Old Testament the priest used to minister to the people. So he takes some of the gold, he takes some of the ornaments that they had, some of the, the clothing, the royal clothing, and he makes it into a religious icon. Look at verse 27. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Wait a second. God calls him, you mighty man of valor, earlier in chapter 6, raises him up, <clears throat> gives him all these signs, gives him this great victory. And then he, then he, takes, a, he takes a dive spiritually. He goes from cutting down the idol in his father's house, and after this great victory, he sets up another idol, and then it's a snare to him and a snare to his people. And God's definitely not pleased with this. So you learn a couple lessons here that, well, it's like the war could be over, but there could be landmines all over the place. If you go to some areas of our world even today where there's been a lot, Afghanistan, Angolia, some other places, Cambodia, there's still thousands of landmines from previous wars. Some wars may be over, some may be getting, but people are still stepping on those things. Same thing spiritually. Oh, man, what a great battle we were through there. We got through that. There's landmines all over the place. And one of the landmines is be lifted up in pride. What's a common theme <clears throat> with, with, with men and women in the church is, you know, they're obedient to the Lord. And, and then some, sometimes there's like this celebrity status that they 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 hold on to, <clears throat> and then there's greed, um, and oftentimes it's cash and spirituality. If you look at a common theme, there's always some transgression into what God is saying. You're not allowed to do this. Saul was going to do an offering, something a priest could only do. He was done. He was king. Same thing with Uzziah. Let me read this to you. Very very you know. Sad, but a good warning to us all. Uzziah, it said, his fame spread far and wide. He was a godly king. For he was marvelously helped until he became strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. And you know the rest of the story. God struck him with leprosy. The fame spreads, the reputation, the celebrity status, your heart gets lifted up, you're strong, you win, you've got wealth, you have a military, you've got people behind you. I could do this. I can make an ephod. I could. And God said right there, right there. You got people to transgress. You transgress, and then you got people to transgress. Pride. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall every time. Why do people go off track? Somewhere there's pride. Somewhere there's, I can do this. I'll take the glory. I'll take the credit. I did it. I can get away with this. So it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. And so it's a warning to us. We'll just read the rest of this chapter and we'll pick up a chapter 9 next week. Then Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons. 
who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. It's a problem. Could you imagine having 70 kids? <laughs> and his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name is called Abimelech. We'll get to him next week. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age, was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, and Oprah of the Abizarites. Ab and so it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bereth their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. We'll close there tonight. So, the good thing, we step out by faith, we trust the Lord. If you want to know the will of God, inward impulse, the word of God, trending circumstances. Don't ever do anything outside of the written word of God. God will give you clarity for his will, for your life. It's not hard for him to do that. We just need to follow him. When we're weak, we're strong. Give God all the glory. Don't receive praise. Don't receive praise. Billy Graham said it well once. We're never more like Satan when we take the glory from God. That's what he wanted to do. Only God is worthy of our praise and glory. We know that. We're here tonight because of the cross of Christ. God forbid that I would glory in anything except for the cross of Jesus Christ. All praise, all glory to him. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual by the power of his might, not our own. And we'll be safe. Easy? No. Difficult? Yes. Tests? Of course. Victory? His. Lion minds? Watch out for him. If Satan doesn't win one victory, he'll go after us in other ways. Stay humble and follow the leader.